Hey there folks, welcome back. In our last lesson, we defined the concept of a surface integral for a scalar field. And today we're gonna check out some examples on setting up and evaluating these integrals. So first, I'd like to consider the surface S given by the portion of the cylinder, x squared plus y squared equals four, that lies in the first octant of R3 and below the plane z equals three. We are given the mass density of this surface at a point x, y, z. It's x, y, z kilograms per meter squared. We'd like to determine the total mass of that surface. Just like when dealing with double or triple integrals, it's often helpful to draw a picture to see what's going on. So in this case, here is our surface S. It's the portion of this cylinder that lies in the first octant of R3, but below the plane z equals three. We're looking for the total mass of this surface and we're given its mass density function. Ah, well, hold on. We know that the total mass will be the integral of the mass density function, but now we're integrating over a curved surface. So this is actually going to be a surface integral. Our total mass is the surface integral over S of rho ds. Okay, I have no idea how to compute this thing. So I'm gonna think back to the definition of my surface integral. According to the definition, I need my surface S to be parametrized, right? I need a parametric equation that traces out this surface. So looking at this picture, I see that S can be described really nicely in cylindrical coordinates, right? I could write it simply as R equals two. Well, how could I write the points X, Y, Z in terms of cylindrical coordinates? X is given by R cos theta, so in this case, two cos theta y is given by r sine theta, so two sine theta, and z is given by, well, z. And there you go. We obtain a parametric equation that traces out our surface. r of theta z equals this expression here. Based on where our surface lives, we can see that theta is gonna range from zero to pi over two, and z is gonna range from zero to three. Okay, once we have a parametric equation, what comes next? Well, again, we turn to our definition. According to definition, this surface integral is the double integral over d, the set of all possible values of our parameters theta and z, of rho of r of theta z, we plug in our parametric equation, and we multiply by the norm of r theta cross r z dA. Okay, well, this first term is easy enough to deal with, right? I can replace x, y, and z with their descriptions from this function r, and that's gonna give me the double integral over d of two cos theta, two sine theta, z. But what about this term, this norm of the cross product? I don't know what that is. To figure it out, we're first gonna have to find r theta, r z, and then take their cross product. So r theta is obtained by differentiating this expression with respect to theta. We're going to get minus two sine theta, two cos theta, and zero. Our z on the other hand is obtained by differentiating with respect to z. We simply get zero, zero, one. Okay, we have to find their cross product. The cross product of r theta and r z is the determinant of the matrix i, j, k in the top row, minus two sine theta, two cos theta, zero in the second row, and zero, zero, 001 at the bottom. I'll let you confirm that the resulting vector is two cos theta, two sine theta, zero. Okay, back to our integral. We're gonna multiply by the norm of this cross product, which we've just found to be two cos theta, two sine theta, zero. At this point, it's just cleanup. We have the bounds on theta and z, so we can write this as the integral from zero to pi over two of the integral from zero to three, this term is gonna become four cos theta sine theta z, and I'll let you confirm that this norm here is simply two. We have dz d theta, and now we evaluate. In many of these examples, setting up the problem is the hard part, but the actual integration is not that bad. So I'm gonna leave verifying this computation as an exercise, but you should get a total mass of 18 kilograms. Think back to our last example. We spent a lot of time parametrizing our surface S, finding its tangent vectors, computing their cross product, and then evaluating its norm. 
As I've mentioned before though, if s turns out to be the graph of a function, z equals g of x, y, then we can cut down on a lot of this work. We can parametrize our surface using the vector function r of x, y equals x, y, g of x, y, and then in general, this expression gives us the norm of the cross product. It's the square root of 1 plus the sum of the squares of the partial derivatives. This expression allows us to write our surface integral as the double integral over d of f times this square root dA. It saves us from computing these tangent vectors and from finding their cross product. So with this in mind, it's really good if you can recognize your surface as the graph of a function. The cylinder is not the graph of a function, but in our next example, we'll see that this formula really does apply. So let's jump right in. Here, we're looking to evaluate the surface integral of e to the z squared over the surface s, where s is the boundary of the solid in R3 enclosed by the cone, z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared, and the plane, z equals 1. We're dealing with a pretty interesting surface in this example. S is the boundary of this solid, which is enclosed between the cone, z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared, and the plane, z equals 1. So really, it looks like our surface can be broken into two simpler surfaces, right? We have the surface on the side, which is the surface of this cone, and then we have the surface on the top, which is a plane. If I want to integrate this function e to the z squared over the whole surface, well, I could work with each of these surfaces separately. I could first integrate it over the side surface, s1, and then I could add the result to the integral over the top surface, s2. This is going to make my life a lot easier because I don't know just one parametrization that applies to this whole surface, but I could parametrize s1 and s2 separately. So let's focus on s1, this cone surface. Notice that this is the graph of a function, z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared, which maybe we'll call f of x, y. It can therefore be parametrized by r of x, y equals x, y, the square root of x squared plus y squared. Ah, now since we're dealing with the graph of a function, we can use our formula from the last slide. The surface integral over s1 of e to the z squared ds is going to be the double integral over d, the set of all possible xy values, of e to the z squared times that big square root, right? The square root of 1 plus partial f by partial x squared plus partial f by partial y squared dA. I'm going to let you compute the partial derivatives with respect to x and y, but you should find that partial f by partial x is x over the square root of x squared plus y squared, and likewise, partial f by partial y equals y over the square root of x squared plus y squared. Okay, back to our integral. We have the double integral over d. I'm going to replace z with this square root, so I get e to the x squared plus y squared, and now inside my square root I have 1 plus x squared over x squared plus y squared plus y squared over x squared plus y squared dA. And at this point, a small miracle happens. These two terms add to 1. So this ugly square root is really just root 2. Okay, we're almost there. We now have to figure out the bounds on this integral. You can see that our surface S1 is going to have x and y values throughout this circle. This is the circle that we get by projecting our surface down onto the xy plane. And it's the same circle that you see up here, right? The circle that we get by intersecting the cone with the plane z equals 1. Well, if z equals 1, it's not too hard to see that this is actually going to be the unit circle. x squared plus y squared equals 1. So maybe it makes the most sense to write our integral over the unit circle in polar coordinates. I'm going to pull this root 2 term out front to get root 2 times the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 1. This is going to become e to the r squared, and our dA will become r dr d theta. Now, I know you can evaluate this integral with a quick substitution, so I'll leave this part to you. You should get a final answer for this first surface integral of root 2 pi 
times e minus 1. Okay, on to the next integral. Integrating over s2 is much, much easier. This is the graph of the function g of xy equals 1, and hence it can be parametrized by r of xy equals xy1. Since we're dealing with the graph of a function, we can apply our little formula for calculating the surface integral. We have the double integral over d of e to the z squared times this square root. Ah, but check it out. This square root is really going to simplify. Since g of xy equals 1, both partial derivatives are 0. So this ugly expression here is really just 1. Our e to the z squared term also simplifies. According to our parametrization, z is 1. So this term here is really just e. It's a constant, and I can pull everything here out of the integral. I'm left with e times the double integral over d. d is the set of all possible x and y values, which for s2 is also the unit circle, of 1 dA. Ah, but if we're integrating the constant function 1, we're really computing the area of d, the area of the unit circle, which is pi. This gives me an answer of pi times e. By adding this result to the value of our integral from the last slide, we get a final surface integral of root 2 pi times e minus 1 plus pi times e. Whew, time for a nap.